Welcome to the uh, webinar on utilizing Service Canada's uh, confidential tip line for temporary foreign workers. Um, I will be introducing the speakers as we go through the program, but before we get too far along, I want to welcome everybody. I'm David Ivany, part of the Empowering Temporary Foreign Workers During COVID-19 team. Uh, and I'll be moderating, moderating today's session. Uh, I would like to acknowledge that we are meeting today on the traditional territories of the indigenous peoples across Turtle Island. We thank them for allowing to meet and learn together on their territories. To the original caretakers of the land of which we stand, I acknowledge the traditional territories of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, where I am right now. To all that was here for thousands of years before us across Turtle Island, we honor the struggles and the lives of those who gave themselves for it. For all those here today, we acknowledge the ancestors beneath our feet and the land on which we stand. With our ears to the ground, we can hear them. The Cree Nation, the Métis, the Diné, the Anishinaabe, the Dakota and Lakota Nations, the Inui, the Blackfoot, the Inu, and all of nations that came before us and those yet to become. An infinity of footsteps of those who long called this land home, the unfolding of bundles, the undoing of colonization and the opening of this land to allow treaty to come alive. We affirm our relationship to each other and to the land. We acknowledge and pay respects to the indigenous nations and ancestors of this land. Once again, I acknowledge the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the, Ish uh, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples where I am right now. A few technical notes for this uh, webinar. Mm -hmm. To help keep noise disturbances at a low, we ask that you remain muted until called upon during the Q&A. We hope to have plenty of time for Q&A uh, and the chat feature will be available through the presentation for you to engage. Feel free to introduce yourselves as you continue to come in and where you hail from. Uh, during the Q&A, I will read questions from the chat into the discussion, um, and you can also use the raise hand feature to queue for asking questions that you may have. There will be two Q&A sessions, one after the presentation from Service Canada, and one after our partners in the project have presented. We will be recording this session, so you are free to ask questions with your camera off if you would prefer. Similarly, if you do not wish to be in the audio recording, uh, put your questions in the chat and I will read them in. Uh, this webinar will be translated into Spanish and that audio file will be made available for download and dissemination at a later date. Uh, the ETFW team is here with us today. We have uh, Mitos and Connie and Jay Lynn. Um, and I believe Vessel will be joining us uh, soon as well. Um, and we have Vessel here as well. Uh, and uh, we have members of the Kairos team here as well. Uh -huh. uh, as we move into this, the session, uh, this webinar will discuss the use of Service Canada's confidential tip line for reporting the abuse or misuse of temporary foreign workers, how to use the tip line, and what happens when a call is received. We will also discuss potential barriers to its use and how those of us who support workers can help in using the service. To start, we have Jonathan Larrakis and Mark Douglas, Senior Program Advisors in the Integrity Service branches, Services Branch of Service Canada. Uh, we appreciate Service Canada uh, partnering with us on this project uh, and we thank each of them for speaking today. We appreciate both of you coming here to better inform us about the tip line and its use. You can take it away. Thank you, David. Uh, good afternoon, uh, and thank you for inviting us today to speak about Service Canada's tip line for TFWs and to speak about our inspections process. My name is Jonathan Larrakis, and with me is my colleague, Mark Douglas, who will also be presenting. Uh, 
we are both senior program advisors for the Temporary Foreign Worker Program. And the information being presented today is current and up to date as of this presentation. So if you are watching a recorded version of this webinar at a later date, uh, please check uh, Service Canada's website to get the most up-to-date information. Goal for today is to provide you an overview of the journey of a tip or allegation that is reported to Service Canada, starting with how to report to us and what we do after a tip has been received, uh, including our inspections process. Uh, and so we're always looking at ways to make the temporary foreign worker program better for workers. And we rely on feedback from partners such as yourselves to do this. And so last year, uh, several improvements have been made to our reporting process based on what we heard from migrant worker support organizations and TFWs themselves. First, we made it easier for people to report abuse to us in their own language. Uh, our telephone tip line has inst uh, instructions in English, French, and in Spanish. And depending on when they call the tip line, Callers may also be able to speak to a live agent, uh, a live service candidate agent directly in one of more than 200 languages through an interpreter that will also be on the line to translate the conversation uh, between the agent and the caller you know, as it's going on. And secondly, we've redesigned our online reporting tool to streamline it, making it easier to read, understand and use. So with that said, if you need to report to us, you can do so through two main ways. You can call our call center and either speak with an agent or leave a message, depending on what time you call. The telephone tip line is available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and is free from any telephone number in Canada. Right now, the live agents are available from 6.30 a.m., to 8 p.m. on weekdays and weekends and holidays from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. All time zones are Eastern time. So all time zones in Ontario and Quebec. Outside of these hours, callers can also leave a voicemail with details of what's going on and or their contact information uh, for an agent to follow up on. Uh, and secondly, uh, you also have the option to submit uh, on our report, uh, to submit a report on our website, uh, which is accessible on a computer, tablet, or uh, smartphone. <laughs> Bless you. Um, so actually a quick survey. Uh, before this presentation, uh, before this presentation, before this webinar, have you known about or heard of this tip line? So if, if you guys want to use your reaction buttons to raise your hands that, yes, I have prior to this. Yes, I've been aware. Okay, so I see a couple of thumbs up, a couple of thumbs up. All right, so that just goes to show there's still a lot more work for us to do in promoting this tip line. So thank you again for those who have uh, responded. Um, and so when should you report to us? So below are just a few examples of situations where you can report to us. Uh, situations where the employer is not paying the TFW during their quarantine. Um, situations where the employer is not providing cleaning supplies to help sanitize and keep the accommodations clean. Um, situations where uh, they're not providing accommodations that are in good condition or not providing a workplace free of abuse. I'm so sorry. <laughs> and just as a friendly reminder to just keep ourselves on mute as we continue through this webinar. Thank you. And so when making a report uh, at minimum, we need details about the employer and details of the situation, such as what is happening, who is involved, when did it take place? Where did it happen? Uh, your contact information or the information or the informant's information is optional, but it helps us if we need to reach you for additional information. Always remember that you can remain anonymous when you do report. 
uh, which leads us to our next slide in protecting the privacy of workers. So Service Canada takes the protection of TFW privacy very seriously. And according to the Supreme Court of Canada case, R versus Liebert, Service Canada does not release information received from third parties who wish to remain anonymous. In cases where a TFW wishes to remain anonymous, Service Canada inspectors will use the information they provide as a basis of what to inspect, but they will be very careful not to share any information that could identify the source of the information to the employer. The information the caller provides, or the lead or the tip, is not a part of the employer's cases file. Uh, and it's not included in the file. This is to make sure that in the event the employer or anyone else makes a formal request through Canada's access to information and privacy laws, also known as an ATIP request, the information about what prompted the inspection will not be included in the response. So after a report has been submitted, we determine if in fact the employer is a user of the temporary foreign worker program. We determine if it needs to be redirected to another department or agency such as IRCC, RCMP, or the local police. We evaluate if we need more information. And based on the information that we've received, we determine the next steps. Which leads us to our next section, which will be presented by my colleague, Mark Douglas, who will go into more details on inspections. Thank you very much, Jonathan. So uh, if you go to the next slide, please. So what causes an inspection? There are five key reasons that Service Canada can launch an inspection according to our regulations. The first reason is that we've received a tip or a lead that a business has not been complying with their LMIA. In addition to receiving tips from the tip line and online tool, tips and leads can also originate from news outlets, provincial partners and stakeholders, foreign consulates, third parties, and the workers themselves. The second main reason is an earlier inspection has found the employer non-compliant. So if an employer has previously been non-compliant, they will be, we can actually launch an inspection as a result of that. The third reason is that an employer is selected for a random inspection. Service Canada utilizes a risk modeling system that identifies high-risk regions, occupations, and industries, and randomly selects employers based on their risk of non-compliance. The fourth reason is the uh, inspecting employers whose temporary foreign workers are or were subject to the Quarantine or Emergencies Acts. Finally, we can also launch an inspection in the case where there's the introduction of the communicable disease where the temporary foreign worker works. So for example, if we find out that there is someone infected with COVID-19 at a temporary foreign worker's work site. So how are inspections conducted? Service Canada conducts both physical, on-site, and virtual inspections. When Service Canada inspectors go to a work site, they will have picture ID that lists their name, their job title, and the organization they work for, Service Canada. Inspectors will always ask the employer to show that they are meeting the terms of their labor market impact assessment. They'll ask for proof such as documents, photographs, and they'll interview the employer, their staff, and their TFWs separately and privately. In Canada, there's a clear delineation of authority between federal government and the provincial and territorial governments. Public health and workplace safety are mainly the responsibility of the province or the territory. For this reason, Service Canada has also started to work with our partners in the provinces and territories, as well as other federal partners, to coordinate inspections and help fight the spread of COVID-19. Service Canada must respect provincial or territorial authorities when conducting our inspections. To help with this, last summer, we conducted joint inspections with the provinces in both Ontario and British Columbia. We're working to improve collaboration with our provincial partners to improve our inspections and to improve employer compliance, which directly affects temporary foreign workers. Service Canada can inspect a workplace with or without first telling the employer that we're coming. If we notify our employer in advance, we call it an announced inspection. Otherwise, it would be an unannounced inspection. If an employer is selected for an announced on-site inspection, the inspector will contact the employer before arriving and explain why they've been selected for the inspection, what the employer will have to do, and provide them with the date that will be on site. If an employer is selected for an unannounced inspection, their first contact with the inspector will be when they arrive at the work site. 
When the inspector arrives, the employer must let them onto the worksite to see where the workers work and if the employer provides accommodations where they live. While on site, inspectors will take photos or video, collect documents, and conduct interviews with the temporary foreign workers and the employer. The employer is expected to provide reasonable assistance and access to the inspector. This means doing whatever they need to help the inspection go smoothly, including giving the inspector access to documents and to their employees for private interviews. In the event that a TFW is selected for an interview, don't worry. We're interviewing the temporary foreign worker to confirm the employer's compliance. We're not, in, we're not inspecting the temporary foreign worker. We're inspecting the employer. An employer has been notified of inspection do, who does not show up or give access to the work site and workers will need to provide justification. Due to COVID-19, Service Canada has introduced virtual inspections under certain circumstances. Specifically, Virtual inspections can take place in situations of known outbreaks or when workers are in quarantine. Virtual inspections allow us to inspect without spreading the virus. Given the seriousness of COVID-19 and the danger it poses, virtual inspections are carried out under very tight timeframes so that any issues can be identified and addressed. During a virtual inspection, the inspector will contact the employer by phone. The employer will be required to submit information such as photos and documents and show that, uh, show, that show their compliance through email. The employer must also make sure that the inspectors can interview the temporary foreign workers in private, either by phone or by video conference. So what do we inspect? Service Canada can check that employers are following up to 28 different conditions. Some of the conditions where we most commonly see violations include wages, so situations where the employer is not paying the wage confirmed on the labour market impact assessment, working conditions where the employer is not meeting the working conditions laid out on the labour market impact assessment, Housing provided by the employer, if they're required to do so. Situations where the employer fails to provide the documents to demonstrate compliance with their labor market impact assessment. And that the business is legitimate in operation and able to employ and pay its workers. So what are we looking for when we do our inspections? When we conduct our inspections, we're looking for the employer to prove that they're complying with their LMIA. This means that they must prove that they've been paying the workers properly that the TFW's working conditions match what was in their contract, and that the employer is following the employment laws of the province or territory in which the worker is working. We also want to see that the employers do not do anything that keep workers from following the Quarantine and Emergencies Acts. Some specific examples of what we look at. We look at timesheets or proof of the hours that the temporary foreign worker worked. We want to see that they are paid properly. These documents should show uh, the worker's start and end times and when they took their breaks. Proof that the temporary foreign workers were paid their wages. Often employers will submit payroll information, but we also want to see proof that the workers were in fact paid. So for example, if they're paid by check, we want to see the front and back of the check to make sure that the uh, temporary foreign worker negotiated the check. Records of cash advances. We know that in a lot of situations, when temporary foreign workers arrive, they ask for a cash advance from their employer. We want to see that the uh, evidence that the temporary foreign worker did in fact request the cash advance, received it, and agreed to the repayment terms. Accommodations. When inspecting accommodations while on site, we frequently identify discrepancies between the accommodations provided to the foreign worker and the housing inspection reports. Examples include non-functioning or partially functioning appliances, missing screens on windows, or vermin and bugs being present. Next slide. Next. Once the inspector has completed fact-finding, they'll advise the employer if the inspection is complete and the employer has been found satisfactory. If non-compliance has been identified during the inspection, the inspector will advise the employer that they must provide justification. If we identify non-compliance during fact-finding, the employer has provided a chance to justify why they were not compliant in accordance with the Immigration and Refugee Protection Regulations. They're asked to provide a detailed explanation as to why they are not complying and explain what steps they've taken to rectify the non-compliance and prevent it from happening in the future. If the employer provides a credible, acceptable justification in accordance with the regulations, they will be found satisfactory. If the employer justifies their non-compliance due to an error made in good faith and they're found to be non-compliant for the same condition in the future, that justification will not be accepted. If the employer is still not compliant after submitting their justification, they'll be sent a notice of preliminary finding that outlines the consequences. 
This notice is the employer's final opportunity to provide new information that may change the decision. Any new information submitted is objectively reviewed to determine whether it changes the outcome of a case. If the employer is still not compliant after the notice of preliminary finding, they'll receive a notice of final determination that advises them of any penalties and or bans from the program. So what are the consequences of non-compliance? If after resp responding to the notice of preliminary finding, the employer is still found non-compliant, they can face a penalty and or a ban from the program. Non-compliance with any of the conditions can result in penalties up to $100,000 per violation to a maximum of a million dollars in a calendar year in the case of multiple violations. The employer could also face a program ban that ranges from one year to a permanent ban in the most severe cases. Non-compliant employers will have their business details posted to an Immigration, Refugee and Citizenship Canada public website. The website will outline the consequences of non-compliance and why the employer was found non-compliant. That's the end of our presentation today. Uh, so we welcome any questions you have. And as always, we encourage you to go and check our websites for up-to-date information on the current state of the program. Back to you, John. Anything to add before we get to questions, Jonathan? Um, no, again, so we're always looking at ways to improve, you know, the reporting process. And so we're always open to any feedback you guys uh, may have, if not about our tip line, uh, about our service, or even about this presentation. So if you guys do have some comments or feedback you'd like to share, if, for those of you who have used the tip line uh, in the past, um, we are always open to whatever feedback you guys have to share. And so I'll actually leave, um, pass it back to David, who will facilitate um, the Q&A session. So thank you again so much for that. Uh, I'm sure there are questions arising from this. So uh, please use the raise hand function uh, as I'm seeing people are starting to do and feel free again to add your questions to the chat. Um, oh, great to see people um, already raising hands. So we're gonna get to the questions in one minute. I just wanna say that um, as uh, illuminating as they can be, um, hypothetical situations uh, would be difficult to answer um, in this context. So let's uh, try to keep questions to, um, to, uh, to more questions rather than uh, proposing hypotheticals. Uh, so we're gonna start with uh, Father Peter. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, one question I just wanted to ask off the bat is about the findings of the report. Are the employees or and or intervening party, like let's say ourselves, if we're intervening on behalf of an employee, are we privy to the findings as well? So due to privacy considerations, an inspection, it'll always be between Service Canada and the employer. So unfortunately, um, that information will not be available to anyone outside of um, the employer. And just a, sorry, this is a second question, I promise I won't uh, monopolize. How many tips on average are handled um, on, we on a weekly basis? Is there data on that? We do. Um, so actually, I do have the stats. So because the service is still new and we've been monitoring it since its uh, launch uh, in April, like the live agent, because prior to the live agent, I was strictly just voicemail. And so um, since April 1st, the latest we have since April 1st to August, end of August, is we've received roughly 3,300 um calls that have come in through the call center and leads that have come in through or tips that have come in through our web web tool are around 434 for that same time period uh, but again that's just through those two main channels there are other ways that we we receive tips and allegations um, and but those are the stats that i have on hand is for our online tool and for our tip line so since April 1st to August, we're looking about 
together, you're looking about 4,000 tips cumulative, almost 4,000 or Thank calls. You. Yeah, and both from both. Thank you. Uh, okay, we're going to go to Iswani. Yes, hi, um, and thank you for the presentation. Um, my question is, um, is there a, a, a document or a line where it specifies what is um, considered bad housing? Um, what would be including when you want to report in bad housing? Because that's kind of a very um, <clears throat> large term, right? Bad housing can be different things from each other, from different people's perspective. And will that be part of like, for example, health? I have heard about uh, cases that is a lot of bed box problem uh, in the housing of uh, migrant workers, like uh, in the bunk houses. Um, in, in my opinion, that's um, something to do with health, but I have heard that it's not. So could you please clarify on that? Well, actually, um, so this is more of uh, an inspections question that I'll, I'll pass on to Mark. So uh, with regards to um, vermin and bugs, such as bed bugs, we would ask that that be reported to us uh, so that we can uh, look at doing an inspection on that. Um, with relation as to what is bad housing, um, we're unfortunately limited in terms of what we do um, based upon uh, what the housing inspection report is. So um, what it boils down to is as long as the housing meets the inspection report, then it's considered to be acceptable. Um, housing inspection reports are handled by different groups depending upon which province or territory, and even in some cases, which municipality they're in. Um, however, if there are issues such as, um, you know, uh, insufficient uh, space for TFWs to properly socially, uh, physically distance, um, or if there are situations such as there are inadequate facilities for the temporary foreign workers, um, elements such as no running hot water, um, you know, those are the type of elements we will very definitely look into. Um, beyond that, unfortunately, because there are so many different uh, standards across the country, it's hard for me to give you a blanket statement as to uh, what would be considered bad housing. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that question, this one. Um, and on the topic of inspections, uh, Jalen had a question in the chat. Um, how is it decided whether the inspection is announced or unannounced? Uh, right now, um, for the most part, um, a lot of our inspections are announced because of the, the risk of COVID-19. Um, during uh, sort of a more standard time frame, um, we would be looking at um, depending upon the assessed risk of the employer. So if, for example, we received a lead uh, or an allegation that the employer was uh, not doing something appropriate, um, that would be much more likely to be an unannounced inspection. Um, however, certain industries, because of the nature of the industries and the risk it poses to uh, people coming on site, uh, would mandate it being an announced inspection. So uh, it's, a, you know, again, it's a bit of a difficult one to, to, to answer, but uh, it's mostly dependent upon the risk level of the situation as to whether it will be announced or not. Thank you for that. Uh, we're going to go to Kit. Hi, thanks, David. And thank you, Mark and Jonathan, for your presentation. Um, I have uh, another question about the inspection, specifically about the interviews with workers. Um, these interviews, are they um, random workers selected by the inspectors? And if so, are the employers notified that these are indeed random? Um, because otherwise there might be, you know, the situation where the employer sees certain workers being interviewed and might single them out um, as the ones who reported the conditions. Um, or is it the case that the employers choose which workers inspectors speak to, which um, can cause problems um, that are quite obvious. Um, and I'm asking because these are, these are situations that I've supported workers themselves um, in dealing with and supported them in, in, in reporting. And they've come back to me saying, um, you know, the, the employer saw me being interviewed, so they think I'm the one who made the report, or the employer or supervisor chooses which workers speak to the interviewers, um, depending on which ones will say what's acceptable 
by the employer. Um, so that's my first part, the selection of workers. And then the second part is the privacy. How is Service Canada ensuring the privacy of workers who are selected for interviews? Um, so in the cases of uh, uh, virtual interviews, how does Service Canada ensure that the employer is not in the room with the worker while they're being interviewed? Thank you. So uh, with regards to your question, I can only partially answer it. I, I'm not gonna be able to go into detail about how we select workers. Um, however, I will say that employers are not, uh, we, we don't uh, leave it up to the employer to decide who we will interview. Our inspectors do choose who will be interviewed. Um, but I can't go into detail about how we specifically select workers uh, for obvious reasons in relation to both the protection of the workers and in terms of uh, making sure that employers do not know how we make our selections. So I'm, I'm sorry, I can't go into detail about that. Uh, with relation to how do we verify that the employer is not in the room with the workers, it is absolutely a challenge that we face. Um, and it's one of the reasons why we try to make sure that we're always doing um, video conference interviews, but that isn't always possible depending upon the level of technology available to the temporary foreign worker. Um, but yeah, when we're doing remote interviews, we are seeking to do it on video conference uh, so that we can verify who else is in the room with the temporary foreign worker. Okay, thank you, Mark. So you can't say whether it's random random interviews um, or whether it's um, workers selected by the employer? Well, it's not workers selected by the employer. Thank you for that. Um, let's go to uh, Cooper Institute. Hi there. Um, I, I just have, I have two questions. Um, just building off the last question that was asked, when translation is required for an interview with a worker, um, who is providing that translation? It's provided by Service Canada. Okay, thank you. Um, and then the other question that I just have is, um, when it is an, an announced inspection, when communicating with the employer, what is shared with the employer in regards to why an inspection is happening? So according to the regulations, we are required to provide the employer with the trigger of the, um, of the inspection. So whether, whether it is passed on compliance, whether it is a reason to suspect, uh, whether it is due to workers having had to quarantine or whether it's due to the introduction of a communicable disease where the TFW works, but that's the extent of the information that's provided to the employer. Nothing further is provided. Okay, so like if a, a complaint came in through the tip line or the online system, um, it would be communicated that they that it, uh, they would not be told that a tip or an allegation came in. They'd be told that uh, we received information that led to the inspection. Okay, great, thank you. I'm not certain that this question can sort of be answered in this space, but uh, I think it's an important thing to note. Uh, it's been asked, uh, if no one else knows the results of the investigation, how do we, um, as like as allies to migrant workers, have faith in the, the process? Um, I think it's kind of about like what information potentially could be available to uh, people invested in workers or um, uh, in terms of uh, trusting that the information is being carried forward. I, I completely understand where you're coming from, David. I know that this is something that's been extensively brought up with our skills and employment branch, who are mm -hmm. our policy division. Um, unfortunately, I don't have anything else I can really say about it. Um, but uh, but I, I I hear what you're at, I hear what you're saying. Um, obviously, whenever an employer is found non-compliant, it does get posted on the Immigration, Refugee, and Citizenship Canada website. Um, but that also can take a very long time before that happens because of the number of steps we have to go through to find an employer non-compliance. So um, I do completely understand where you're coming from with relation to that. Thank you for, thank you for that. Uh, we're going to go to Christina Gomez. Um, good afternoon. Okay. I have a qu my question is in a different way. Uh, I would like to know how often the owner farmers update regarding regulation and um, because if we have that fear maybe we have so many claims about uh, 
um, many different problems the worker has to face. So if the owner of the farm have updates and they know how much they should pay for any kind of fault or they didn't follow the regulation. So they shouldn't happen to many irregularities in the farm. So I would like to know how Service Canada update the owners of the farmers regarding regulations. Um, I think the question you're asking is uh, how often do we update employers about the about changes to regulations? Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Um, again, that isn't something that Integrity Services Branch um, handles, so it's a bit difficult for me to answer that. I do know that any changes to the regulations result in um, our Skills and Employment Branch notifying all users of the program. Uh, oh, sorry, all employers of the, the use of the program um, and also employer associations uh, through an email push. But that's about all I'm really positioned to answer. I'm going to bring in one more question from the chat and then do one more question um, on the mic. Um, and then we're going to, there will be more time for q and I'm just going to move it to um, the presentations from our partners. Um, but uh, there's a question, a few questions about uh, how workers are informed about the, uh, the tip line um, and uh, like how the process is explained to workers. Uh, like does Service Canada have a strategy for informing workers about the, the tip line? Um, and what that process looks like on, uh, whether it's on the spot or uh, not for the, uh, for the interview. So in regard to the tip line, that is something that we're currently working on is how to promote it further among foreign workers. Uh, and so I think last year, or I think it was this year we've announced uh, funding to help support organizations such as yourselves to who work and deal with migrant worker support organizations uh, who deal with TFWs directly um, in, in you know, assisting them. Uh, and so we're working such as today, uh, working more collaboratively, occur collaboratively with other partners such as yourselves to do these outreach sessions to promote the tip line. Um, and so some of the feedback that we have heard uh, through these kinds of forums is that Although there are some organizations out in BC, let's say, I know um, after doing some outreach with BC, there are organizations that you know hand out pamphlets at the airport when TFWs do arrive. That is the extent of the kind of work that's being done, but we do acknowledge that there's more opportunities to further um, further promote uh, and, and educate foreign workers on what resources are available to them. And this is just the start. So we're always happy and open to uh, working together to do more in promoting the tip line, whether it's having you know a little laminated card or whether it's having sessions such as this. Um, Eduardo, I will bring uh, more of your questions into uh, the chat in a little bit. Um, I'm gonna go to Connie uh, first, and then I'm gonna take one more question on the mic from Rachel. But, but again, there will be more time for our question and answers after our partners. Um, thank you, thank you very much, uh, David. And thank you very much, um, Jonathan, for your last comment, because that's exactly you know what we're also trying to, to do. Uh, there's quite a bit of, and I would say this, you know, uh, honestly and frankly, there's quite a bit of, um, I wouldn't say suspicion, but not many workers or majority of the workers are not trusting, you know, uh, to file a complaint on the tip line and, and file allegations, right? Because of fear of reprisals. And what we're trying to do now with our community partners who are directly working with migrant workers, workers on the ground is bridge that gap and having this session, for example, having you come and present uh, and being able to respond to the questions that our community partners are, are raising is, is a step forward in developing that relationship and creating you know, that trust. Because whatever happens and what 
you know, at this conversation, whatever transpired in this webinar is definitely going to be transmitted to the workers that our community partners are working with on the ground. And also to, and to mention that we do have airport support services at the Toronto Pearson International Airport and included in the information materials that we're providing is about the tip line. So we are, you know, we are collaborating in terms of getting the information out and hopefully more workers are able to trust the process and, and, and be able to, you know, uh, uh, and reluctantly come, come, come out and use the tip line. So I just want to, yeah. Thank you very much for that comment, Connie. I think one thing I want to really emphasize is that it's really important that when our uh, inspectors are on site and interviewing the foreign workers, that they let us know what's going on. Because one of the biggest problems we have is that we'll receive a tipper or a lead or an allegation and we'll go on site and we'll interview a variety of workers. And all the workers will tell us is, oh yeah, everything's fine. And that really handicaps our ability to pursue with the inspection, we need to hear from the workers, you know, what the issues are, what's going on. And it's really important that they, that they be prepared to talk to us when we are on site, because the intention is when we're out there to interview them, we're there to try and find out what's going on so that we can take the necessary steps. And we completely understand that, you know, number one, they, they certainly fear reprisal from their employers and, potentially from other people who are involved in their situation. They potentially come from countries where they do not have faith in the government. We understand that as well. Um, and so as a result, us being there and speaking to them is, is not something that they want to have happen. We completely get that. Um, it's, it's just the unfortunate situation that we need to be able to find evidence that the employer is not uh, complying with their LMIA. And that's where they can really help us. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's move to Rachel. Yes. Hello. Hi. Hi, folks. Uh, my name is Rachel Lake, and I'm a lawyer at Waterloo Region Community Legal Services. Um, so I connected with a group of migrant workers about a year ago um, and um, have been successful with four open work permit applications for abused workers. Um, so I was just wondering whether there's any communication between the IRCC department that issues the open work permits for vulnerable workers or um, or like, yeah, I guess just whether there's any yeah, communication between between Service Canada and IRCC on that front. Um, yeah. So again, it's not really something that I'm well equipped to talk to, but that being said, um, we do communicate with IRCC through our uh, internal channels whenever we receive um, tips, leads, and allegations. And likewise, when they receive applications for open work permits, they communicate with us as well so that we can take the appropriate steps. Um, but there are limits in terms of what information can be shared. Uh, and, um, you know, again, I'm not in the best position to talk to this, unfortunately, because it's not really my area of expertise. Um, all right, so um, people with their hands raised, we will come back to uh, Q&A session, but I do want to uh, shift to uh, our partners in the project uh, talking about it, and this may bring up some of the um, concerns and questions that we have as well. So um, for now, you can leave your hands raised and uh, I'll keep you in the queue. Um, but for now, um, we have uh, Stacy Gomez, who coordinates uh, No One is Illegal Halifax uh, Chibuktuk's uh, Migrant Workers Program, uh, which is engaged in outreach, direct support, public education, and advocacy in solidarity with migrant workers throughout Nova Scotia. So far this year, the program has reached well over 1,300 migrant workers in the province in the province. Uh, known as Illegal is a member of Nova Scotia's Migrant Worker Rights Working Group. You can go ahead, Stacey. Thank you. Uh, it's good to see everyone. Uh, so yes, uh, Known as Legal Halifax Chibuktuk's Migrant Workers Program provides 
confidential support to migrant workers throughout Nova Scotia on issues such as uh, violence in the workplace, unpaid wages, workplace injuries, and uh, threats that uh, workers face in, in being sent uh, back home. Uh, and we have supported migrant workers to make complaints to the ESTC tip line in the past, and we've made complaints on workers' behalf when requested. Uh, so one benefit of the ESDC tip line is that it provides an anonymous way for migrant workers to make a complaint. Um, and because migrant workers are tied to one employer, uh, this puts a lot of power in the hands of the employer. And often migrant workers fear uh, speaking out uh, due to risks of reprisals, um, including being fired, sent back to their home country, and not being able to return uh, back to the Seasonal Agricultural Workers Program uh, to Canada. So anonymity, uh, is often important for workers. However, if a migrant worker does make a complaint, uh, this will not lead to rectification of the issue in their specific situation. For example, if there's a situation of unpaid wages, uh, this would not result in them receiving uh, wages. Uh, that would be more through the provincial labor standards. Uh, moreover, uh, as we've uh, spoken about, uh, they would not uh, be informed the results of the claim or uh, or complaint rather, and nor details such as whether an investigation is underway. Uh, so that is a, a big limitation. Um, I'm going to share a bit of what we've heard from workers uh, around uh, the tip line and investigation process. Uh, so we've heard that when on-site visits do happen, uh, the employer has selected who will speak to the investigators. Uh, visits happen during uh, the daytime when migrant workers are working and therefore not available to speak with investigators. Uh, many reports have been made by migrant workers about a specific employer, but they uh, have not seen a uh, result from those complaints. Uh, we've heard employers being notified in advance of on-site on -site visits and fixing it so that it seems better at the time that the investigation takes place. Uh, and we've also uh, heard of migrant workers being threatened and coerced to speak positively of the employer. Uh, there's also a number of concerns uh, that we have as well. Uh, so for a period during the pandemic, on-site visits were not happening. Uh, and we know that migrant workers have been disproportionately impacted during the pandemic. Thousands across the country have uh, become ill with COVID-19 and a number have also uh, died uh, from, from COVID-19. Uh, and one major concern uh, which I'll just talk about briefly, is a lack of confidentiality during on-site visits. Um, and really the only way to ensure anonymity is for workers to leave a complaint uh, online anonymously or over the phone anonymously. Um, so there are risks uh, for confidentiality during on-site visits. And I'll follow up about that uh, later uh, directly. Um, and also penalties are rarely imposed. And in most cases, they're not severe. Uh, so in 2019, only three employers were suspended from the program uh, through this investig investigation process. When suspensions did happen, in most cases, it was only for up to two years. And in 2019, 51 employers were fined. When they were fined, it was often also for a very low amount, uh, from $100 to $3,000. And uh, just to give an idea of scope, in 2016, I understand that there were 1,600, sorry, 16,000 employers who received positive labor market impact assessments. That's a document that's needed to hire migrant workers. Um, so uh, in conclusion, uh, the ESDC tip line is one of the tools available to migrant workers uh, who are experiencing abuse in the workplace. Um, however, uh, if the aim is to protect migrant worker rights, uh, it appears that it's falling short. Um, so there is a need for greater transparency. Uh, for example, having information on employers who had complaints made against them public and also the results of those complaints. Uh, if a labor market impact assessment is revoked from the employer, it's important to guarantee that the migrant worker receives an open work permit to be able to uh, find employment elsewhere. Uh, and we're also, uh, join other organizations across the country in advocating for full and permanent immigration status for migrants, uh, including migrant workers. This would ensure that migrant workers are able to ex exercise the same rights as all other workers. Uh, and that includes being able to easily uh, move to another employer if they're experiencing abuse. 
uh, current, uh, the current avenues that exist, including the vulnerable worker open work permit are limited. Um, for example, uh, it's quite labor intensive, uh, not very accessible to wor workers to do uh, on their own, for example. Um, so yeah, those are the, the reflections that we wanted to share today. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Uh, we're, uh, we can definitely bring those issues into the uh, discussion as we carry forward with it. Um, I did want to um, move on to uh, a reminder that yes, there will be more time for questions shortly, but first I want to welcome uh, Fanny restrepo Belkowski from the Center of Migrant Workers Solidarity in Simcoe uh, to share her experiences, if she has any. Uh, Fanny has been an important voice for temporary foreign workers and uh, a really critical voice in these webinars, so I wanted to have time and space for her to uh, share her experiences with the tip line. Um, and if she has anything else to add to this uh, important conversation. Uh, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I just have three or four points I wanted to ask is um, we're running into, you know, if you are inspecting for payroll, uh, there's a situation where it looks perfectly legal when you go in, it looks as if they've worked 40 hours and they have all the paperwork, but then um, the, uh, the rest of the pay after 40 hours is all cash. And so workers tell me on different farms, that's just how it's done. So then when they try to get benefits, they look as if they only worked 40 hours. So that's one question. Or I'm wondering too, with WSIB, I, I don't know if you get involved if there's a WSIB case, but you know when, peop, when, when suddenly there's an investigation, then the employer then fixes things, didn't pay during a, a period when there was an accident. The worker became distressed, wanted to go home. And then when WSIB comes in, then suddenly, he's paid for that period and it all looks great in the books. The book bookkeeping, if you look, would look just great and it would make the, the worker look as if he's a liar and would make his WSIB case look weak. Um, so those are two points I had. And then I just had um, um, two other comments. Um, if you are interviewing workers online in video, you may see everybody on the screen, but the door might be open in the background. So the workers just are so terrified of never being asked back, that they're terrified, they probably won't tell you how it really is. If Even if you see everybody on screen, there may be a door where someone could hear them. Um, and the final thing too is with open work permit, I don't know if you ever deal with this, but with open work permit, uh, it's great if we can get it, but then when we go, you have to give your resume, you have to give you know, where did you get your experience driving a forklift, you know, and so you can't name the employer that was abusive, where you were for 13 years. Um, so those are some of the scenarios we have. I uh, really appreciate the feedback uh, in relation to those elements. Um, unfortunately, there's not much we can do about situations which, as you describe, where the workers aren't prepared to advise us uh, as to what's going on. For example, if an employer is in the room where the door is open, as you described, um, it is one of the reasons why we do try to uh, get out and conduct our, you know, interviews in person when we can. Um, but it's not always possible either due to the situation with uh, COVID-19 or, um, or, or what have you. Uh, so, or, or an outbreak on the site or, or et cetera. Um, with relation to WSIB, unfortunately, uh, there's not much we can do about how they conduct their, their investigations. Um, they are not a... a federal department they would be uh, provincial um, and uh, unfortunately there's anything we could do about that part of it. Thank you for your question Ella and uh, we're going to go on to uh, Julie Aladua. Yeah thank you so much thank, thank you for this great presentation it's pretty clear pretty nice but I'm telling you I'm a former migrant farm worker and I'm telling you about two years ago, I attended a similar session, and you know what the, the, the person from the government officials, you know what she said? They never, ever used the hotline. Why? In earlier, I heard that you have made great strides in making language, you know, the taking of that barrier, language barrier. Right now, about 200 languages are available. That's great. That's great. That's beautiful. But the real fear, the real fear from the workers are not being addressed. What is the plan B? For example, here's a simple example where um, we talk about, um, some people have been talking about the vulnerable workers permit. That is, that is, that is 
a band-aid, yes, but it's a dead end. At the end of the, the one year open work plan, what happens? The worker goes, it's a brick wall. What happens to the worker? That's a dead end. That's a trap for workers. That's not taking out the barriers. That's creating more headache for a worker. When, what are the, the barriers that the workers facing? What are the barriers? When will we address the barriers? And that is what we need. Language is one, yes, but that's not the main barrier. At the end of the day, the workers come here to put bread on the table, to support their family. What is there to guarantee that they do a fair day's work in Canada and get a fair day's pay? What is there? And that is what we are failing to address. So many times I'm heard from you all, we cannot answer that. We cannot answer why? Because we try to do things in isolation and we know that the whole, all the problems that migrant workers face, the 20 injustices that I face, they have every, every, every level of government. Why are we having a session and, and we are in isolation from the other stakeholders, the other parties, and we know that our whole system is stuck against migrant workers. When are we going to get all the cards on the table? That is the challenge I have. And how can we address that? That is my question. I'll leave it as that, the only question I have. Hi, Dave, um, and everybody, I'm here. I'm really sorry. Yeah. It's, it's, it's busy, busy here. We had some um, Caribbean workers coming and they wanted to talk to me. So <laughs> I am really sorry. <laughs> so do you want me to still explain about um, the cases I had here at the center? Um, yes, I think just in one, uh, in one quick moment, um, yes. I'm not certain if anyone, uh, wants to respond to, uh, the last, uh, the last, uh, we have Connie. Yeah. Oh, you're muted. <laughs> no, yeah. no, I, I, I. I, I, I'm not going to respond to uh, Gabriel's, okay. you know, uh, question, but I want uh, Mark and Jonathan to, you know, uh, to respond to to Gabriel if they're, you know, if you have a response before moving on to to yeah. Fanny, because I don't want that question kind of left hanging and yeah, very. Thank you. Thanks, Carmen. Um, so Mark or Jonathan, anything to say in response? So you, uh, thank you again um, for sharing, um, you know, your, your feedback. I think it is, it hasn't fallen on deaf ears. We, you know, I'm only speaking from an integrity point of view. Um, and, and what we can do and what I can say is that, you know, we are, we're doing what we can to address some of these issues, but some of these are, you know, are things to deal with, you know, regulations and policy, um, which have also, you know, have been heard by our policy folks and our regulation folks. Um, and without, you know, because I can't speak on behalf of them, but I do know that having my own experience in attending other sessions like this, um, such as through the Migrant Worker Support Network, um, you know, I can assure you that ESCC is working hard to, you know, address um, a lot of the frustrations that you guys have communicated to us today. And like with us today isn't just Mark and I, we also have some other uh, Service Canada colleagues who also work in the operation side of things who are hearing your feedback and will be taking it back to uh, our managers and directors of, you know, some more of the feedback that we're, we're hearing and how we can improve and change, you know, our, our process and make it better. Okay. And now, Fanny, <laughs> thank you for, uh, thank you for pausing and thank you for uh, prioritizing workers uh, at the center. So take it away. <laughs> um, in the Simco area, we had, um, a, I, I called the tip line uh, twice, and um, I, at the beginning of the, in April, around April or May, uh, some workers from Jamaica came to the office, and they were complaining that the employer was deducting uh, some, uh, some wages um, that the employer was not supposed to deduct. 
So, um, and the housing conditions were not, there was no social distancing and the, the housing condition was deplorable. So I called the tip line and uh, within about two weeks, uh, Service Canada, I think, went to the, the, the farm and I think the farm has been audited by Service Canada. So um, the workers called me uh, very happy, uh, stating, uh, listen, someone came over here and we think it's Service Canada. So um, I haven't heard from the, the workers yet, but I, probably it's going to be a long process for Service Canada to investigate. But um, it, that was a, it was really successful. And, and I encourage everyone um, to, if you guys see any abuse or someone, a worker complains, because it could be one worker that has the courage to complain and has no fear. Uh, so if you, every, everyone, if you have a worker that has a problem, please call the tip line. Uh, a, I had another farm where the workers were not able to come out um, to come shopping. The farmer set up a store in the, in, in like at the farm. And uh, now the workers are coming to town because I think uh, these workers are being affectedly, affected mentally while they are in these farms for five, six, seven months with no way out. So, um, so any any farm where the workers are not being able to come out, please, please call the tip line. I encourage everyone to do it, please, because it's 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 affecting the workers mentally when you are stuck in a farm in a farm for uh, such a long time. So um, it's been uh, very successful, and. Um, and thank you for uh, Service Canada and, and uh, you know, everybody working on behalf of the workers, they need us. <laughs> thank you so much, Fanny, for, for sharing the stories. And it's good to hear um, that, that the complaints do move through the through the system. Um, it's important to note too that as partners uh, or as people providing support to migrant workers, um, there is the, because the process of reporting a tip is anonymous and can be done by voicemail as well, um, it is possible to help um, with moving a complaint from a worker to uh, service provider and then that service provider forwarding the tip along um, as just a suggestion for like adding that extra layer of um, anonymity to the process. Uh, so taking as much information as you can um, from the worker and then calling the tip in yourself to further that anonymity in the process. Um, I wanted to get to um, Eduardo's question. I know, Mike, you're next in line with the hands, but um, Eduardo, did you want to speak to what you wrote in the chat slash ask a question? Uh, and Mike, we'll get to you immediately after. Sure, um, thank you so much. And thanks for the presentation, Mark and Jonathan. <clears throat> um, I work for a network of occupational health clinics. So we have some experience trying to, you know, um, I guess, promote and, and look at the Ministry of Labor's uh, kind of similar in theory um, reporting uh, number for their call center. So we kind of experience working with workers who might have occupational health and safety concerns or even injuries and, and uh, you know, looking at how they report. And, and so there's a lot of very similar themes. So I think I, I put in the chat a bit about the importance of how um, especially for those in-person inspections or, or worker interviews, how the whole process is explained to workers. I think that's so fundamental because um, when we were working with the Ministry of Labor early days uh, about their inspections, there was a lot of work that had to be done about basically 
um, ensuring that their inspectors were trained to understand kind of the context in which these workers are facing that, that Gabriel has, you know, really well pointed out um, so that, you know, that sensitivity is really at the forefront of, of, of this whole thing. Um, I, I do imagine, you know, I'm not at all surprised that it, the in-person interviews don't tend to be very, uh, you know, worker or workers are not so forthcoming sometimes because, you know, we encountered even, you know, the threshold for a worker to speak out is so high because of the fear of losing their job. So we encountered even workers who were injured, uh, you know, like injuries that could actually put them into serious situations of being able to be welcomed back to the program. If their injuries get worse, then they're screened back home and they don't even come back. They, you know, there's even a reluctance in, in those levels of workers to speak out. And what we found in terms of the reporting to the Ministry of Labor is it was often workers who didn't even want to go back to that farm anymore. You know, they, they, it was so high the risk that they were basically going to report and and throw away the, you know, the the thinking that, well, I'm probably not going to be asked here, but things are so bad that I don't even want to be here anymore. So it's really a challenge to lower the threshold because we're really talking about decent work, safe work for workers, not to a point where they're just so exacerbated that they're willing to lose their, their job and opportunity. So I, I know it's a challenge. There's no easy solution for that. But I do think then, you know, training for inspectors, um, the process explained. So I think that if your first touch base, if, if the first time a worker is hearing about this process is when the inspector arrives on the farm, I, I'm very kind of, you know, reluctant to think that a lot of workers will speak out. So it's to say maybe it's that's the first touch point. And I know that obviously all your inspectors are not necessarily going to be out on any farm twice or three times. Like I understand staff, you know, and resources, but maybe it's envisioning about, you know, a first touch base on that farm to say, this is the process, you know, think about it. This is, this is, I'm, this is how I ensure you your safety, your confidentiality, and then, you know, contact me on your own time or, or here, you know, or some sort of follow-up process so that they're not having to make a decision to participate on the spot with, you know, them maybe first time engaging with a government of Canada person, maybe first time thinking about complaining. So you're kind of catching people to have to make that decision that they're thinking could jeopardize their employment on the spot, right? So I think that's just some things to consider. But um, but as as um, as uh, Gabriel noted, I think a lot of this is so attached to just the precarious empl you know employment situation that people are in, right? And so we're asking them to report, we're asking them to be the drivers of of improving their conditions when at the other end, what kind of protections are we tangibly providing them, right? Uh, if not, it's just them risking uh, for decent work in Canada that should be insured by, you know, governments. But yeah, complicated for sure, but. Thanks, Eduardo. Do we have a response from uh, Mark or Jonathan in terms of, Yes, the, the sort of like contacts with inspectors um, and potential for uh, that not being the only contact, um, the inspections on the farm. Yeah, we definitely appreciate the, the, the comments. Um, I know that a lot of our inspectors will provide temporary foreign workers with their cards so that the temporary foreign workers can reach out to the, to the inspector on their own time uh to discuss um we haven't found as you might imagine a lot of uptake on that but you know it's definitely one of the things that our, our inspectors do do to you know try and make it so that the tfws are comfortable talking with us thank you okay uh mike you can it's pretty clear that a lot of the workers are apprehensive to come forward um and when you're doing your interviews for the inspection um they might be apprehensive because of uh, anonymity or confidentiality concerns. Um, is there any potential to use the locations of outreach organizations as a secure space for workers to come forward so that they don't have to worry about the employer being there or other workers that you know might not agree um, and they, they'll have uh, more anonymity um, in one of our offices if they can come in and you guys can do your interview either online, uh, you know, they can have a, an individual space with a computer there that you can talk to them online or you could even conduct the interviews in person at one of our locations uh, uh the locations of an outreach organization is that is that anything that you could that you would consider or is the logistics kind of a uh, you know would it would it be too hard to to organize 
I can't speak to that specific situation where we would be on, uh, for example, one of the NGOs, uh, migrant worker support organizations. But I do know that in the past, uh, Service Canada inspectors have interviewed um, uh, temporary foreign workers at Service Canada centers without uh, without employers being around or at various other neutral uh, points. Um, but again, I can't speak for every inspection or how every investigator handles their, uh, how every inspector handles their work. Um, but I do know that has been done in the past, certainly with uh, making use of, of sites that are off the employer's work site to interview TFWs. If the TFWs come forward to the inspector and ask to be interviewed. Um, to move to a few questions from the chat, uh, what happens when an employer continuously commits infractions? Um, and can't provide a reason. Well, it just the penalty. So, uh, for example, if uh, it's the first infraction for for a lot of elements, um, it, there's a table that's actually set out in the Immigration Refugee and Protection Regulations. Uh, if anybody's interested, um, it uh, I believe it's Table Two, but I'm, I don't quote me on that. Um, but it actually lays out how we calculate out the amounts that we um that upon the um non-compliance how many people are affected what the type of effect is you know all those different elements uh, you know did the employer take any all of those elements um so i would certainly encourage anybody who's curious to go and take a look at the regulations it's uh, it doesn't go into, you know, the specifics as to how we would determine it, but it does lay out how it's calculated. Um, so in, in the event that, a that an employer has previously um, committed an infraction, then the, um, the consequences escalate, both in terms of duration of any bans, if they receive one, the amount of any uh, administrative monetary penalties, uh, etc. Um, so all that is on there. And it does definitely uh, escalate as it goes on. Uh, as I mentioned, one of the common uh, justifications that a lot of employers have used in the past that we are, uh, you know, uh, certainly working on on limiting their use of, which is part of the reason why we're doing employer outreach and other steps to educate employers on their responsibility. Uh, an error of interpretation made in good faith, where the temporary, where affected workers were uh, subsequently compensated for any. Um, uh, any errors on the employer's part. So for example, let's say an employer underpays a TFW, um, then if they use that justification, they would have to compensate them for the amount that they shorted them. Um, if that justification is used, uh, then that justification cannot be used again in the future for the same incident, for the same type of situation. So, um, you know, absolutely, we do um, take a look at the employer's past history when figuring out whether or not there will be an administrative monetary penalty and calculating that, and also whether or not they'll be. Thank you. And I'm going to take one more question from the chat um, and then move on to uh, Iswani. Um, do you, uh, do you have any cultural outreach workers who can build that trust and dialogue? Like, are there workers that aren't inspectors that are getting the word out um, to start that relationship? Or is it, uh, is it currently just inspectors that are sort of building um, the sort of I can't speak to that exactly, but one of the recent um, one of the recent uh, pilots that was run, uh, as I'm sure uh, several of you are aware of, was the Migrant Worker Support Network in British Columbia, uh, where Service Canada brought together uh, multiple different uh, migrant worker support organizations, employer associations, migrant workers, uh, academics, uh, different levels of government. So, for example, uh, provincial government, um, foreign consulates. Um, and, uh, and others into a uh, symposium where uh, methods of improving um, my, you know, things that we could do both in terms of educating migrant workers uh, to migrant worker support uh, organizations in terms of reaching out and providing assistance to workers, um, and educating everyone on the integrity and the nature of the program. So we, we've certainly done some steps in that. Um, I'm not sure where that is at. That is, a, that is a program that's managed by our skills and employment branch who are our policy side. 
Uh, so we're not really in a good position to talk about it. Um, in terms of from our perspective, we're often the ones that go out and actually speak with the temporary farm workers, um, just due to the nature of our work. So we do try to make sure what's going on, how they're helping, what they're doing, et cetera, when we go on site. But, uh, you know, again, we do appreciate that to a certain extent, there may, may be a, a, well, there is a lack of trust, um, even though we are doing everything we can to assist them. Thank you. Uh, Eswani, did you want to ask him the question? Yes, thank you, David. Um, okay, so thank you so much, Mark and Jonathan, for the information. Um, I am uh, um, I'm from Mexico, and I am I work on the ground with a lot of workers, uh, migrant workers, and um, sometimes it's um, I think difficult for us to see that we have this tip line, and uh, there is still a lot of um, ways that this tip line is fa uh, falling short to help workers, like Stacy Gomez uh, stated. Um, <clears throat> I don't know how long, and uh, like you say, Mark, there is a document, but hey, or how many complaints does it take to really change something in a farm, right? So until an employer is really uh, with his offers penalties where he cannot get workers, so there is also a, a, a change on it because um, seems to change immediately and not even like in a course of months. So if a worker is here uh, going through these difficult conditions, housing conditions, or healthy, um, or health uh, kind of uh, that is being put in uh, their health jeopardized, it doesn't seem that it's changing that quickly. It takes months, maybe next year, or maybe it doesn't happen, right? I know it, it's a process and it takes a, a process. And like, um, I heard that there is, yeah, some fines uh, that is going to the farmers, but farmers, $100 is nothing, $3,000 is nothing. They can pay it in no time. So that's one question. And I think that um, maybe I'm kind of asking it again, but it's just my point of view. And um, the other part that I'm thinking is very hard, like you say, to build uh, um, trust between you and the workers. So do you go, when you go on the site, do you take an interpreter that is cultural, familiar, or like it's the same culture than the person that is working there? For example, if you have Mexicans in the farm, you take an interpreter with you, the, the inspectors go, that is from the same culture, and then, then it's more a bit more comfortable to talk with. Uh, is something that you have considered, is something that you do, is something that is happening. And um, the other part is like, uh, how do you plan to build a relationship? I know it's hard because I work on the ground, but it has always to be na it's nice to have a cultural related person, right? And that is not on the farm. And I find very difficult because uh, I think somebody put in the chat that if you kind of say, uh, we're gonna go there, there is gonna be an inspection. I feel like, and I have heard this from the workers, and I will do it myself, right? Like if I saw, if I know that my friend is coming to visit me, I will clean my house. But if nobody tells me that he's coming and they just show at my door, my house is how it is. Those, these are just my points of view. And I think that aligns with what uh, Jalen was asking about in terms of the interviews. Like, are they conducted in the workers' first language? Um, so when we do conduct our interviews, um, unfortunately, our uh, the, the reality of it is our inspectors are not fluent in every language that we would go out and, and inspect on. Um, we do bring, uh, essentially, we use a, a telephone service called CanTalk, which uh, provides access to, uh, I can't remember, it's a, it's a couple hundred different languages um, for translation. So the translation is uh, basically handled by, uh, through CanTalk, uh, so that we can interview the, the temporary foreign workers in a language that they understand if that's what they request. Um, and interview them in their, in their preferred language, be that English, French, Spanish, or whatever it is, depending upon where they're from. Um, and so we always make sure we offer them that, that choice uh, during, the, during the interview, because uh, there's a lot of nuance um, and a lot of important elements that, that you know, could be missed if we, if we tried to interview them in, a line, in their second or third language, uh, or even fourth language, depending upon the situation. So uh, you know, we, we do make use of, of translation services when we are on site to do those interviews. Unfortunately, the reality of it is, is that um, and I, I totally understand about having somebody who is from the particular culture uh, can make a world of difference. Um, the reality of it is, is that we don't have access to those resources. I 
just wanted to acknowledge uh, Vilma's uh, comments in the chat. Um, I think the uh, open work permit uh, issues are ones that uh, we should continue discuss, to discuss, and I'm hoping to uh, bring that conversation further um, in these webinars, potentially. Um, but uh, the issues are certainly related between the, uh, the tip line and uh, the potential for uh, the open work permit. Um, but I understand that that's not necessarily in Mark and Jonathan's wheelhouse. So uh, thank you for your comments. And we've taken note of them for future sessions. Um, we have just a few minutes left. Um, Claudio, is your question quick, <laughs> perhaps? Um, yes, and I then we'll... Try. Okay. Okay, so I appreciate the information provided by Mark. My question is to do with the final report done after the investigation. Uh, you, Mark, mentioned that this is a confidential report between Service Canada and the employer, but I'm thinking, is the migrant worker interested to know the, the final result? Let's say I, I make a phone call through that uh, secret line and, and I want to know what is the result of the investigation. Can you provide a report? Thank you. John, do you know the answer to this one? So like a copy of the report that they had submitted, um, like the, the tip that led to the inspection or the final report after the investigation has been done. The later. The latter. Unfortunately, we don't provide any final reports of investigation to the foreign worker. Um, because of, again, we're, it is limited in the, because of privacy considerations, it is limited between Service Canada and. Um, I, I, I will just yeah. jump in here. We don't actually provide the final inspection report itself to the employer either. Um, if, you know, what the employer will receive is they'll receive a letter either yeah. stating that they were found satisfactory or they will receive uh, a letter outlining the consequences of their non-compliance. So a, as far as it goes, they either get a, a, a letter stating that they were satisfactory or they get a letter uh, called a notice of final determination that stating that they were non-compliant. So, but how we can improve that? Like, do we have to call our member of parliament and try to change your policies? You, you know, we are trying to help these migrant workers. And if, if Fanny mentioned you need courage to call and she encouraged everybody to call if you have a problem, but how can you know if my problem is resolved if you don't even know the final result? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's certainly a challenge. Um, the sort of the echo chamber of the, or the lack of an echo chamber, I suppose, of the, um, of the process. Um, it's good that there are Service Canada reps here um, hearing this, and hopefully they can carry that forward. Um, unfortunately, we have arrived at time. Um, if there are any quick closing remarks from our speakers, um, now's the time. <laughs> um, Mark or Jonathan? Anything Thank you very do. much for having us today. Um, as we mentioned, one of our main goals is to try and improve education and outreach, uh, both on the worker side and also on the employer side. Um, we want to make sure that employers understand what their responsibilities are, and we want you know workers to know what their rights and protections are, and that we are here to try and help them. So, um, you know, absolutely. Thank you very much for for having us today. Thank you so much. Any last words from Stacy or Fanny? Just thanks for inviting us to speak. Uh, it's good to hear uh, just the concerns that are being raised and uh, also uh, perspective from Service Canada around how, uh, yeah, uh, how things work on that end. Thank you. Thank you. And Connie, any, anything to wrap up from you? I think Mark uh, wants uh, uh, to say something to Mark. Oh. oh, it's not Mark, sorry, uh, Jonathan. 
I was looking at Jonathan, but I was <laughs> No, uh, I echo what Mark said. Again, thank you so much for this opportunity, and we're always open to hearing um, more about your experiences and feedback, and we will make sure to bring it to the right people and bring it to the right tables um, for the right people to who can um, move things forward. Thank you, and 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 thank you so much, uh, Jonathan and Mark, for for coming and uh, sharing, you know, your presentation and just being part of the. To you, to Stacy and 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 Fanny, and and to all that are here uh, participating in the conversation and just wanted to say that uh, one, thank you so much. And also to uh, to assure you that, you know, this is this is just the beginning of, you know, more conversations uh, with Service Canada and other government departments. As, as you all know, we are funded, you know, by Service Canada, uh, by the government to provide support and services to the migrant workers since December uh, until the present. So the relationship, uh, the current relationship and the community partners relationship in, with Service Canada is very new, but we bring with us, you know, the issues and, 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 and critique of uh, the different processes and hear the complaints of the workers over the years of our working with them and over the years of our advocacy. And uh, and this, you know, this moment where we have this support and funding, and I think we are and the same, you know, the same goal in providing support and services to the workers that I think we are finding a common ground on how we can continue doing this and being more open and transparent and, and be frank in putting forward, you know, the questions and critique that we have, keeping in mind that, you know, we are not here to antagonize and we are not here as enemies, but rather we're, uh, we are, you know, open to finding solutions and further collaboration in addressing, you know, these uh, issues and challenges. So I hope, you know, that um, we, we have more opportunities uh, to be able to do this. I heard, you know, uh, Gabriel's point, I share that and so many others. And I hope that over the course of time, you know, we would be really addressing you know, some of the root causes and some of the questions, the hard questions that we, we, we have had over the years. So again, thank you so much and, and uh, more, more webinars and conversations like this coming up. Thank you. Um, I've put in the chat a link to um, subscribe to the Migrant Justice uh, Kairos email list, uh, where we will be um, posting information about future webinars. Uh, we have a few uh, cooking up as we speak, so uh, we look forward to getting the word out about that. Um, and thank you again to all of our speakers, and thank you so much for all of your thoughtful questions and comments uh, through this uh, webinar. Uh, please take good care through the day, and uh, as we have uh, when we have a copy of this webinar in Spanish, we will disseminate it to our partners um, and we will have information through our uh, website and social media as well. So thank you so much and I hope you all have a lovely day.